So welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, another version of uh, our ECB COVID-19 webinars. And today we are welcoming Tom Britton. Uh, Tom is a professor at uh, Stockholm University. He's the first mathematician in our series into a number of epidemi epidemiologists, uh, the usual fair macroeconomist, and we thought it would be very uh, important since we are trying to forecast how the epidemic will affect the Tom has written one of the handbooks uh, on this and has uh, prepared for us a presentation on an application to something like COVID-19. So we're very much looking forward to that. Um, and please send your questions via the chat button and uh, keep on the mute button so we can listen to Tom. So with that, uh, over to Tom. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Can you just, can someone confirm that you can hear me now so I know it's working? It's working, Tom. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, the plan for me is to give a 45 minute presentation. Let's call it a popular version of how uh, mathematical models for infectious diseases uh, are constructed. And I will, of course, try to make some connections to COVID 19. And then you will be able to ask questions. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what you want to know. I, of course, I tried to put this uh, in, in the talk, but uh, it's good to have questions later on. So before I start, let me just say that I'm not an expert on virology, nor am I an expert on uh, sort of practical aspects of prevention policies. But what I do know is uh, models for infectious diseases, and I've been working in this area for uh, uh, 30 years. I got my PhD 25 years ago uh, on this type of modeling, and I've been working on it mainly for the rest uh, since then. So, uh, I have sort of three sections of this talk. The first is the real world, which I guess you are interested in. And then we go back to the modeling world, where I have been working mainly, but I've also done some applied work. And then we go back to focus on COVID-19. So, here you see a reported number of cases of COVID-19. Uh, over time, uh, there is the first peak uh, here, which corresponds to the outbreak in China, and then there is a much bigger peak here, corresponding to Europe and the US mainly. And this is not the only type of graph that looks like this. This is quite often the case if you have a new outbreak of a new disease. It looked very similar for Ebola. It looked similar when you had the new swine flu pandemic in 2008, 2009. So this is a common feature. So when you see this type of things and you're a modeler, or if even if you're not a modeler, the type of questions that you might ask, okay, so here is what we see. How many will get infected? When will the peak of the outbreak be? How about the uh, effects of different preventive measures? How, what, can, what can that have? What effect will that have? And another important one is, is there any other type of data that would be good to collect in order to improve precision in our statements? Um, and here's another uh, figure of reality. So this is called an endemic disease. And in fact, this might be the situation for uh, COVID-19 uh, in a few years from now. Hopefully by then we have a vaccine and better treatment. But there are a lot of uh, endemic diseases circulating in a, uh, on the globe. And this one is called rotavirus. I don't think it's that harmful. It is for f children, but for adults, most people don't even notice that they have it. They have a little cough and that's it. And this is reported number of cases. And of course, if you, if you see this thing, I've been working a little bit on this data material. That's why I show, show it then. One question that's important, how about underreporting? This is what is reported, how much is underreported? Can we say anything about that? If a vaccination program is introduced, how many are ne necessary to vaccinate in order to stop, this, uh, to stop this endemic situation? So those are typical questions arising for, for endemic diseases. Here is another endemic disease, or what used to be endemic, it's measles, 
uh, considered to be the most in, the highly infectious disease around. It has an R naught of about 15. I will come back to what R naught means. And here we see what happened with measles reported number of cases in the UK. And this is long time ago because now we have a vaccine, so there are hardly any outbreaks at all. But this is UK and this is Iceland. And we see that in the UK, uh, measles was around all the time. And there are peaks coming up and down but it's present the whole time, whereas in Iceland it's not present the whole time. And the reason for that is that Iceland is a smaller community, so there's not enough influx of susceptible individuals to keep it, uh, keep it going. But later on, when some uh, visitor comes to visit Ireland, there is a new outbreak. And here the peaks are actually, sorry, so here the peak is every year. But for measles in the UK, the peak was every other year. So why is that? Well, the simple explanation is that if there is a peak now, then uh, everyone gets infected, and the next uh, most of the transmission is in schools as opposed to COVID-19. And the next year, which is here, when school starts in September, it's only the first graders that have not been infected earlier. So that's not not enough to have a new epidemic outbreak. So we are still. Uh, above herd immunity after one year, whereas after two years, immunity uh, has partially waned, but in particular, there have been newborn children entering school, so that's enough for a new uh, a big spike. Okay, that was a bit of reality. I will come back to reality for COVID-19 later. Uh, but let's now go into modeling. So I thought I would present one of the simplest models just to get a feeling for how a mathematician works. So the simplest model is, of course, not very realistic. But uh, let me emphasize, even though I will not describe them, there are much more realistic models. But let me also uh, admit or acknowledge that all model, all mathematical models for anything is a simplification of real world. That is the essence of mathematical modeling, to simplify the complicated real world and try to make some conclusions. The hope is that the simplifications play a, a minor role so that the conclusions from the simpler modeling is valid also for the more complex reality. But that needs to be sort of verified or confirmed. Anyway, what assumptions do we have? Let's assume that there is no prior immunity. That actually is true for uh, COVID-19. And here is the main... No, yeah. and let's assume that all individuals behave similarly, so that people are equally susceptible, and if they get infected, let's assume that they are equally infectious. And probably the most unrealistic feature of all is suppose that everyone meets with everyone at equal rates. So that is called uniform mixing. So there are no social structures. Very unrealistic, but that's the simplest model. And then we consider it as a disease which is called an SIR. So at first you're susceptible. If you get infected, you are infectious for a while, and then you recover. And when you are in the recovered state, you're considered to be immune. COVID-19 is among this class. It is unclear how long the immunity uh, lasts, but surely it lasts for at least a, a few months, so you will not get reinfected after a few weeks. So SIR is probably the most common model, uh, mathematical model, uh, yeah. And to start off, let's also assume that we don't change our behavior during the course of the epidemic. This is, of course, not true for uh, COVID-19, but probably it is true for the seasonal influenza. We don't really change our behavior during uh, uh, an influenza season. So here is the model. We start with the population size N, and we assume that everyone is susceptible except one individual. And we think in terms of discrete generations. So you might think of week one, week two, week three. So, and the model is as follows. Uh, when we start, we have one infected individual and the rest being susceptible. Then the next week, this initial guy infects each and every one of these independently with some small probability P. Uh, 
So the model has one single parameter, and that is P. And then suppose the result is that this first individual infects uh, by chance maybe three new individuals. Then week two, uh, there are three people infected, and those three people infected, they infect each and every one of these remaining susceptibles with probability P. So viewed from a susceptible point of view, in order not to get infected in the second week, you must avoid infection from all three of the, uh, the infected people. And then this goes on. So maybe next week there are uh, seven infected, and maybe the week thereafter there might be 18. In Fewer people here, they will have moved to here, so there will be fewer, each infected person will infect fewer and fewer since there are fewer susceptibles around. This is an uh, effect of the model, but this is also true in reality. Once immunity builds up, there are fewer new infections per infected individual. So the model goes on until uh, at some week there is no new infections, and then the epidemic stops. So the, the, uh, the model has one single parameter, that is P, and of course there's community size. More, more important than, than P, or let's call it an equivalent uh, parameterization, is to not consider P, but to consider the average number of new infections caused by one typical infected individual during the early phase of an outbreak. That is the definition of the basic reproduction number, and I'm sure that most of you nowadays know what the basic reproduction, or ha at least have heard about it. I think three months ago, very few people in the world knew about the basic reproduction number, but now it's quite well known. So, consider this model I said. Suppose we have a small community of, let's say, 1,000 individuals, and suppose this transmission probability to a specific individual is 0.0015. What is then R0? So uh, here is R0. Uh, you have a, a small probability to infect uh, every, each one, but there are many individuals, so the average number of people that you infect is the probability multiplied by how many that uh, are around. So that is 1000 multiplied by 0, 0.0015, and that is uh, 1.5. So for this choice of P and this community size, uh, the basic reproduction number equals 1.5, and 1.5 is a common value for influenza, whereas for COVID-19, a common estimate of R0 is 2.5, so on average, you infect 2.5 individuals in the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, whereas for influenza, in the beginning, assuming everyone is susceptible, it is estimated, it's believed to lie around 1.5. Uh, okay, that was the wrong direction. So here we go. Oh, here is a misprint. But anyway, uh, so a question is, of course, how, okay, so this is the model. We know what R0 is. Then the question is, how many will get infected? Another question might be, okay, how does incidence and prevalence vary over time? So those are the two typical questions. And then, of course, what happens if we insert preventive measures? Let's start, first of all, with the final number infected, and that's called the final epidemic size. So now we forget time, and we look what happens at the end of the outbreak. So what I've done is I've simulated this model that I described above, not once, but I've simulated 10,000 times. And on the next slide, uh, there is uh, a histogram of not one simulation, but of all these 10,000 simulations. And what I have uh, stored is only the final number infected for each of these 10,000 simulation. So each simulation results in, maybe the first simulation resulted in just three people getting infected. The next uh, simulation might have resulted in 595 people getting infected and so on. So I've done this for two choices of R0. One is, the first one is when R0 is 0 0.8, and the second one is when R0 is 1.5. So here comes the histogram for R0 equals 0 0.8. So here we see that when R0 is 0 
we only observe smaller outbreaks. So there is no big outbreak. How about when R0 is 1.5? Well, then there are still some small outbreaks, but there are also some big outbreaks. The perhaps most surprising thing that there are no outbreaks here and no outbreaks here. All of them are either concentrated here or here. If I would have done the same thing with a much larger community having the same R0, there would still be a spike here, and this one would be much more spiked. So it would, of course, if it was 10,000, it should say 6,000 here and 10,000 here, and then the distribution would be much more spiked. So in essence, there are only two things that can happen. Either you end up here or you end up here. And this is when R0 is larger than 1. If R0 is smaller than 1, we will only have small outbreaks. And why is the value 1 so magic? Well, maybe you believe me that if you on average infect less than one person, there is no chance that such an epidemic can take off. Whereas if R0 is bigger than 1, there is a chance that it takes off. Uh, OK, so now I thought I would actually explain there is actually a formula that can uh, derive what this fraction is. So there is, a there is a formula, and I'll try to explain it. So if you tell me what R0 is, I can tell you how many that will get infected in case we have a major outbreak. So let's call this size Tau. So Tau, you should think of this, it's a Greek letter. You could have called it X if you preferred, but this is an unknown. And we want to see how what is the fraction getting infected at the end of the epidemic. If this is the fraction, then this is the number getting infected. And remember that this small transmission probability multiplied by n was equal to R0. So R0 divided by n is the same as P. And this is the transmission probability. So here comes the long equation. So tau is the, P, the fraction getting infected. So 1 minus tau is the fraction not getting infected. And the fraction not getting infected, that's more or less the same as the probability not to get infected. And the probability not to get infected, if you remember the model, what is the probability that an individual does not get infected? Well, in order not to get infected, you must avoid infection from each of the people that did get infected. They did their experiment to everyone, including you, and they transmitted it to you with probability P. So the probability to avoid infection from one of those people is 1 minus P. Uh, infection from, you must avoid infection from all of those that have been infected, and that is N times Tau, because this is the number of people getting infected. So now I replace P by R0 divided by N. So we have this equation. And I'm sure that some of you have not uh, taken much math. Then you just have to trust me that this expression here is equal to this expression when N is large. So we end up with an equation 1 minus tau is equal to E to the minus R tau. So this is the equation. It, looks a little bit odd, but anyway, if you give me a value of R0, I can numerically solve what Tau must be. It, it's not explicit because you see I have Tau here and Tau here, or if you prefer X, most people are used with X as the unknown, it will say 1 minus X is equal to E to the minus R0 X. It has X on two places, so it's not explicit, but numerically, a computer solves this in a millisecond. So what comes now is a plot of how many that get infected, what fraction that get infected as a function of R0. So here is this. So we see that if R0 is smaller than one, no one gets infected. There is no possibility of a big outbreak. Whereas if R0 is 1.5, which was my numerical example earlier, you follow this line and you see you end up here. And then you go horizontally, you see you end up, if I think I remember correctly, the solution when, two, when R0 is 1.5, the solution is 50, 0 0.58. And we see that this agrees quite well with the simulations. 
And for COVID-19, which is of the order 2.5, it suggests that about 90% would get infected. Let's go back to our assumptions. Uh, well, first of all, the most important observation maybe was that it, when R0 is smaller than 1, there will be no major outbreak. And the results I just explained was based on three assumptions. One was that there was no immunity in the community, either natural or by vaccination. This is true for COVID-19, but not for seasonal influenza. Another assumption was that we had a homogeneous commu uh, community. People were equally susceptible uniformly. This is, of course, not true for any disease, but the perhaps surprising effect, the, the surprising result is that these heterogeneities that are present in reality turn out not to have such a big difference, it doesn't affect things very much, and the effect they have is nearly always that fewer will get infected. So, as a rule of thumb, if you have a rea more realistic model, you would see 20 10 to 20 percent fewer infections and the other the final assumption was that there was no changing behavior during the epidemic uh, okay so now i uh, will show the same type of plot uh, for the situation that i showed earlier but also assuming that there is heterogeneity and assuming uh, and another situation where there is initial immunity so there will be three curves one is the original model one is for one specific type of heterogeneity and the other one is where there is no heterogeneity but there is initial immunity so here is the original curve and this is the curve where there is heterogeneity so we see it is lower than the blue curve but not huge difference. So this maybe this this is just one type of heterogeneity. But if this would fit to COVID nineteen, we can read off here, and we end up here. So then uh, uh, somewhere uh, slightly less than eighty percent would get infected. And probably you have heard this that without preventive measures, around eighty percent will get infected by COVID nineteen. There is a huge difference, however, if there is initial immunity, either natural or by vaccination. For instance, if half of the community are immune, then uh, the basic reproduction number has to be larger than two for, for anything to happen. And if we have uh, uh, R0 equal to 2.5, we see that very, very few will get infected. So immunity plays a big role, heterogeneity plays a smaller role. And then let's take a closer look uh, at R0. Uh, one way to describe R0 is to uh, factorize it into a product of three quantities. You can think of it as a, uh, a probability, the probability that there is transmission given that you have what is called a, a contact. The other factor is how frequent uh, you have contacts with others. And the third one is the duration of your infectious period. What is meant by contact depends, of course, with uh, uh, depending on the type of disease for aerosol-borne or uh, water droplet uh, type of uh, transmission. A contact is considered, well, it's loosely defined as someone that you are in proximity to for more than uh, a couple of minutes. So someone that you speak with for a few minutes that is one way to define a contact here if you're interested in sexually transmitted infections of course then it's a uh, sexual uh, intercourse so this depends on the type of disease you're interested in and there is no sort of strict for COVID-19 there is no of course no strict uh, contact so there is an approximation involved there anyway one way one advantage with this type of um, distinction of the different parts of R0 is that you, when you think prevention, you want to reduce the reproduction number. You can aim at reducing this, this, or this. For instance, how do you reduce the probability of a transmission given a contact? Well, one for COVID-19, one is a face mask, another one is hand washing. Um, if you're interested in sexually transmitted it reduces the transmission uh, probability dramatically. Uh, 
the rate at which you meet people, you can reduce that by avoiding public transport, avoiding public events, also quarantining people as is done currently in um, many European countries. That, of course, dramatically reduces the rate at which you meet other people. And the length uh, during which you are infectious, that is uh, harder to, um, to change, but if, if you do a lot of testing, and you test people positive and then you quarantine them, that is a way to reduce the effective in infectious period. So there are lots of different ways to prevent things. And if you do that, and suppose that the combined effect of all the preventive measures is that you, we manage to reduce the original uh, basic reproduction number by some factor A. So if you uh, reduce this by 50% and you re reduce this by 50% then A is reduced more than 50% of course. So then we get a new reproduction number which is called the effective reproduction number and that is the original one multiplied by the remaining parts. So if you have removed a fraction A of, uh, of all, the con uh, all the effective contacts then the remaining one is uh, the remaining one is uh, is one minus a times r naught, and for similar reasons as before, if we have reduced it, we will have no big outbreak if the new reproduction number is smaller than one, or if if we do this during the outbreak, if we insert preventive measures during the outbreak, the epidemic will fade off rather quickly if the the overall effect of our preventive measures is such that the new reproduction number is below one. And that is the same thing as saying that the overall effect must exceed this quantity. So that is why people want to know what R0 is, because R0 tells us how much we have to reduce um, uh, uh, the transmission in order to stop the outbreak. Uh, herd immunity is another term that has been uh, popular the last few, a few months, um, and uh, here is an explanation to, to it. Suppose that we have a disease and community for which uh, we have a given value of R0. Let's take 2.5 as an example. This means that everyone, sorry, this means that when someone gets uh, infected, you infect on average 2.5 individuals if everyone is susceptible. But what is then the reproduction number uh, once 30% have been infected? And what is the, re the reproduction number when 65% have been infected? Well, if the original reproduction number is 2.5, once 30% have been infected, you only infect 70% of your contacts so the new reproduction number is the original one multiplied by the fraction that are still susceptible. So that's a new number, which for this example is 1.75. Whereas if 65% uh, were infected, the new reproduction number is 2.5 multiplied by the, the fraction susceptible then, which is 35%. So then the new reproduction number is 0 0.87, and this is smaller than one. So then we will have no, uh, then the uh, epidemic will stop. So if once 30% have been infected, uh, the epidemic still grows, but it will grow slower. And once 65% have been infected, the epidemic. What is the border when this is, uh, becomes smaller than one? Well, that is actually easily showed uh, that this is at 60%, or more generally, herd immunity is obtained when the fraction infected exceeds this value, 1 minus 1 upon R0. So whenever this is the case, transmission will fade out, or if it hasn't started, it will, uh, if we do this before it has started, there will be no outbreak. And how about uh, herd immunity once preventive measures are put in place? Well, suppose we have these preventive measures with overall effect A, as we did before. Then the disease will fade out 
once the fraction immune exceeds this number because this was the new effective reproduction number if you remember from the previous slide okay so here is uh, it's not exactly the same figure as i had before but this is also covid 19 another figure so suppose we observe this I've tried to uh, motivate why it's important to know what R0 is. So then the question is, okay, this is what we observe. What is then R0? Well, unfortunately, it is not possible to say what R0 is by only observing this figure. Why is that? Well, this growth rate here depends on two things. It depends on R0, but it also depends on something called uh, the generation time and this is something which is very closely related to the incubation time or the incubation period so you can imagine if you have two diseases one with a very short incubation period and another with a long incubation period for instance COVID-19 which has an incubation period of let's say four days and Ebola which has an incubation period of two weeks then of course if they have the same or not COVID-19 will grow much quicker than Ebola will because it takes another two weeks before transmission takes place. So this growth rate depends both on the generation time as well as R0. And the bigger the R0, the bigger growth rate. So small r is quite often used for the growth rate. So bigger R0 means bigger growth rate. Whereas uh, for the generation time is the opposite. The shorter generation time or the shorter incubation uh, period, the quicker growth rate you have. So this means that there are several combinations of the reproduction number and the generation time that give rise to the same growth rate. So therefore you need some additional information uh, in order to estimate what R0 is. You need to know something about the generation time and that is possible to obtain for example, using contact tracing, that is when you try to find out who people were infected by and then they can see, okay, the infector was infected um, on day 5 and then that person infected a new one on day 12, so that means the generation time for that individual was 7 days. So if you do this systematically uh, investigating, then you have information about the generation time and then you can also estimate R0. So that is how the estimates of R0 usually are obtained. Okay, so what I said up until now was about uh, the end of the outbreak, but of course uh, now we are in the middle of the outbreak, so then we're interested in what happens through time. Uh, so on the next plot I will show two figures. I'm sure you have seen a similar type of figures. But what I'm plotting is the fraction of infectious individual over time model to the one I had, not exactly the same, but closely related. And I have two figures. One is when R0 is equal to 3, and the other one is, let's assume that we managed to reduce spreading from 3 down to 2. So we have reduced the factor A here is 33%. remaining transmission is two-thirds of what it used to be and from the final size expression that we had earlier we know that if this is the case if you look at that blue curve I had earlier then about 92% would get infected whereas if or if the re effective reproduction number in is 2 I looked at this curve and it would say that 78% got infected so this reduction has some effect on the final fraction getting affected. I would say it's not a huge effect. In both situations, we have quite a lot of people getting affected. However, there's a bigger difference. Here is when we did nothing, and here is when we reduced transmission by one-third. We see that the peak is close to reduced by 50%. This is very good news for the hospitals that need to take care of the newly infected. Not all, but some of the newly infected. So this will be much tougher on the healthcare system than this will. Also, there is a delay, which is also good for the hospitals, so that they get time to prepare. This time axis, you should make take no. Uh, it does not. Uh, it's not days or week. Just forget about the time axis. So 
the total number infected in these two situations is not a big difference. The, a much bigger difference is that the peak is reduced uh, dramatically, which is very good for the healthcare system. So now let me end by a, a few words about the corona outbreak. As I said, common estimates of R0 lie in the range between 2.2 and 2.8. I've also seen bigger estimates uh, than 2.8, but these are, this is the most common range. Let me remind uh, everyone that everyone realizes that R0 depends on the disease, but it also depends on the community. So there are differences between communities. For instance, we have seen that it has spread at a much higher rate in southern Europe as compared to northern Europe before the preventive measures were put in place. This has to do with some differences in the, in the, in the societies. So R0 depends both on the disease and the community. That's a very important message I would like to bring to you. Anyway, the conclusion is that if we did absolutely nothing, somewhere between 70 and 85 percent will get infected. And how many that get infected, of course, depends on how we act, both how the, uh, the government acts, but also how we act as individuals. If we have no prevention at all, we behave just as uh, ordinary day life, there will be many infected people and the outbreak will be short in time and after that we will have herd immunity. If, the other, if we take the other extreme, uh, we do complete lockdown, there will be very few infected. And, but after that, or uh, after that, it, we either, either have to have this for a very long time or we can gradually relax it and then there will be more infections coming on later. We can uh, have it for long uh, and uh, hope that uh, some good treatment uh, appears or that the vaccine appears. And of course, there is a range of uh, uh, situations in between here, so you can call them, they are often in the literature, literature called mitigation and uh, you might summarize that, that reduce, not stop spreading, but reduce spreading. And if, of course, you can do this not in one way, but you can reduce it much or a little. And also, this is quite often combined with trying to protect risk groups to reduce the case fatalities. And with this situation, you might, depending on how much you reduce spreading, you might obtain herd immunity after a longer period of time as compared to this situation. And then what happens after the outbreak is over? Well, uh, coronavirus will not disappear from the globe in a long time, is my uh, and most people's belief. So uh, most likely we will have seasonal, we will talk more about, the, have you had the seasonal corona uh, rather than have you yeah, had this vaccine and probably better treatment. So here is a description of uh, an imaginary uh, city. This is assuming homogeneously mixing, so it's not good for a, a, a big country, but con consider a bigger urban area. So suppose it starts here sometime in February, and suppose that at some stage, let's say in mid-March, uh, one country does nothing, and then or one city does nothing, then you have this huge outbreak, quick outbreak, and then it stops down. Another country takes some preventive measures, so the peak is much lower and slightly shifted to the right, and then it fades off. A third country has higher um, uh, reduced measures, uh, preventive measures, and it looks like this. Higher, and this yellow-orange one would correspond to, uh, to a complete lockdown, let's say. So then it drops down quickly and fades out very quickly. And how, what will be the effect of this in the long run? Well, if this was, uh, the curve uh, explains how many new infections there are per day. Here we have the accumulated number of infected people. So this will grow up, uh, or 
it will start with zero percent. So the situation where nothing was done, we have uh, about 90 percent getting infected. Where there were some preventive measures, but not that many, around 80. So we see that we end up in different situations depending on how much preventive measures we put in. And we see that herd immunity, if or not is 2.5, is here. So we see that lockdown and even the other ones with a, a strong partial reduction end up below herd immunity. So if you end up here, and in particular if you end up here, if you, if you relax your preventive measures, there will be a new outbreak. In this situation, there will be a very, very small additional outbreak. But if you suddenly reduce your preventive measures or restrictions here, you will have a rather big new second wave. I think this is my second from last slide, and the timing seems to be fairly good. Uh, okay. I only talked about the very simplest model. There are, of course, much more advanced modeling that many groups do. In Europe, uh, the Imperial Group is the, the most uh, well-known and probably the best group for this. And what do they do? Well, they put in age structure. That is in particular important for the if you want to say effects on the healthcare system. And if you want to say something about case fatalities, then you need to keep track of the age structure. They also have social structure, for instance, they, in their modeling, they have households, assuming that you transmit at much higher rate within households. And they have people going to, children going to school and adults going to workplaces, allowing for higher transmission there. They also have spatial aspects and traveling aspects, both between countries, but probably more important is traveling, uh, commuting within the country. And then they look at diff different types of preventive measures uh, uh, and they try to estimate what effects these have. With such more complicated model, it's, ve it's very hard to say anything analytically. So what typically is done is that they assume a certain, some features here, and then they simulate many outbreaks to see what happens. There is the more different structures you, the, you put into a model, the, the harder it is to give numerical values to all these things. How, how do you know how much more transmission is within and between households? How do you know the effect of school? How do you know how much you transmit within workplaces? So here you have to make a lot of assumptions on the quantitative effects of these things. So that's one part that uh, makes this analysis very hard. But I would say that the hardest part is when you predict the future, because no one knows how people will behave in the future, nor do we know what the restrictions will be in the future. But even if we did know about the restrictions, people can behave differently. So that is the hardest part to predict the future, I think. There's a lot of discussion about the mortality for this COVID-19. And mortality is usually defined as the probability to, do, to die if you get infected. There is another quantity called the case fatality risk, and that is the probability to die if you have been identified as a case. But that is a very different thing, and this is the important thing uh, for the driving force of the epidemic. There is high uncertainty here. I've seen estimates lie between 0.2% and and even higher. And this is meant by a representative fraction of the community, but in reality, most countries try to uh, reduce the risk uh, of infection in the risk groups, and that will, of course, reduce uh, mortality even more. And also, there are big differences between countries, would be my guess, even, I'm, even if I'm not an expert. But uh, first of all, the healthcare system has different quality quality in different countries. Maybe there is much more smoking in certain countries, which I'm sure that would affect the case for the, uh, the risk of dying. So uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in mortality. Uh, and then let me say uh, the first wave, the first wave is what I'm describing here. This is the first wave. And if we relax assumptions here, there might be a second wave. Uh, so for the first wave, uh, in Europe now, I, th I think countries are somewhat out of phase, but I think in nearly all countries, 
we have passed by now we have passed the peak of transmission uh, the peak of transmission maybe not the peak where the healthcare system have the uh, highest load but the peak of transmission i believe that is has it has passed if we keep the current restrictions on but if they are relaxed we will of course have another peak probably but if the current restrictions are kept. I think we have passed uh, the peak of transmission in nearly all countries of Europe, uh, and it the and transmission will be much lower towards the end of May. However, what happens after this first wave will be different in different countries. In in those parts, either countries or parts of countries where. COVID-19 have hit, uh, hit the region very hard, those parts, there will be maybe not exactly herd immunity, but at least very close to herd immunity. So, for instance, Lombardia, I think in the summer, they will have close to herd immunity in Lombardia would be my guess. Whereas other parts that have not been hit very hard, for instance, the Nordic countries, in particular those except Sweden, Norway and Finland, for instance, there will be hardly no immunity. And if there is little immunity in a country, and or if restrictions are suddenly lifted simultaneously, then there will be a strong second wave. If there is partial immunity, the wave will be smaller. If the restrictions are lifted gradually, the second wave will also be smaller. But on the other hand, it will also be longer than. And another important thing is that this is very simplified modeling, and I haven't talked about spatial aspects, and it differs between countries, but also within countries, I think the immunity levels will differ. For instance, in, I think in most of Europe, transmission is much higher in the bigger cities. So uh, after the outbreak, immunity will be higher in the cities as compared to smaller towns and countryside. When it comes to predictions, I think the only way forward is to use models. However, when it comes to the current situation, which I think is very important uh, thing, I think people should ask, how about immunity now? How big is the immunity in different parts of Europe now? Then you can try to say something with models, but there is always a lot of uncertainty, whereas testing is more reliable. In particular, if you test random samples of the community. So one thing that surprises me is why is there not more testing going on in random samples? That way you will get a good idea of immunity. Test. One is called a serological, which tells if someone has antibodies. But if you're currently infected, you don't have antibodies. So that you can test by something called a PCR test to see if you currently have viruses. So one thing that surprises me is why are countries not doing these tests on random samples to get the information about how many are currently infectious and how many have been infected earlier. Another, my end comment is that uh, sooner or later we have to lift the restrictions. However, I think there will be a new normal situation in the sense that we have all experienced this uh, scary disease and I think we will have changed our behavior in a long-term perspective. Maybe we will forget in a few years, but for now I think we will change our behavior permanently. I think there will be less kissing and hugging, in particular in southern Europe, even when all restrictions are lifted and less handshaking probably, less hugging in northern countries that we do quite often. So I think this permanent change will have reduced the reproduction number permanently as compared to what it was. With that, uh, I would like to end my talk and I see that I talked slightly longer than I anticipated. Sorry for that. Many thanks, Tom. Um, <clears throat> there's a big echo. Um, all right, I'll try. So uh, there are a couple of questions that came in. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, 
One is a sort of more technical question on uh, the first part, um, where you showed that um, um, you can either have no outbreak or a very large outbreak. So the, the sort of by modality of the epidemic size. Yes. Um, is that something that uh, is sensitive to the assumptions you put into the model or is this a general result? I would say that it is a general result. So uh, here we have it. So yeah. exactly, so this is for the simple model that I have. Whereas mm -hmm. um, in a more complicated model, maybe the peak will be here rather than here. But th this is why you talk about minor outbreaks and major outbreaks. So for any situation, uh, it will not vary very much. So if we did nothing, we would have pretty much the same outbreak size in uh, Italy as we did in UK, as we would in Sweden. S some small differences because we're not exactly the same, but it would not be the case that 10%, assuming no preventive measures, uh, it would not be the case that only 10% got infected in one country and 80% in the other country. So it is the feature of this model, but I think it's also a feature of reality. Yeah, thank you. Um, then there are a bunch of questions around um, multiple waves, right? So you first showed what would happen in the first wave, and then there's a particular uh, trade-off that would sort of say, well, you want to go on lockdown, but then you also may prevent building up herd immunity. And then you talked about, well, there may also be second waves. And indeed, this is sort of what epidemiologists are telling us will happen. So is there sort of an optimal way of approaching this as a, as a country? Is there a trade-off? Are some countries basically going um, for, for lockdowns for uh, that are too severe, too long period of time, and they will then end up actually in a worse situation down the road? Or is this all dictated by what the health system can ultimately um, manage? I mean, um, how, how do you approach this from a modeling perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, from a modeling, what is optimal, that I think should be left to the politicians. But uh, it is clearly the case that if you have a lockdown, well, if you have a lockdown early on, let's say, I mean, if you have a lockdown very late, uh, for instance, in Lombardia, the lockdown transmission had uh, taken place quite, for quite a while in Lombardia before the lockdown. So I think you they will be close to herd immunity anyway. But if you have a lockdown early on, which, for instance, uh, Norway and Finland has, I don't know all that much about the uh, other countries, but if you have a lockdown early on, there will be very few infect infected people. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when you re relax the prevent uh, the restrictions, then they are at risk mm -hmm. of having a new big outbreak. So I think, uh, I mean, it could be that uh, Lombardia they have had such a tough situation now this this spring, but it could be that in the summer they are have herd immunity, which is a positive side effect of their terrible spring. I don't know if I responded to your question well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was very much thinking, uh, and some of the colleagues as well, about sort of Sweden versus Norway. Um, what's sort of the better approach and uh, what, what dictates ultimately what you, you well, choose? This is... uh, there seems to be something in the middle that is suboptimal, that where you go for sort of half-baked kind of lockdowns, you don't build up the immunity. You need to have this have big lockdowns for a long period of time, multiple times in a row. Um, seems yes, these so models are pointing more in the direction of sort of more extreme measures, one way or another. Otherwise, either you go for immunity or you go for uh, really strict lockdowns. Yes. Yeah. So let's say Sweden and Norway, I know a little bit about those countries. So this is Norway, and I, my guess is that Sweden is somewhere here. And um, we have much more case fatalities than Norway have. Uh, or, uh, we don't, uh, so currently, 
uh, people get sick at the rate which our healthcare system manages. We have they have a tough uh, period, but they manage. Uh, but we have much higher uh, case fatality than Norway. But uh, I was in a in some type of panel meeting with London School of Economics yesterday, and then they showed plots of consumption re reduction in consumption, and I, th I think Sweden had reduced the consumption by twenty eight percent. Whereas Norway had reduced consumption by uh, 60%. So, of course, the more you lock down, the more it hurts society. But on the other hand, you save lives. So, there is a very tough trade off there. How much do you lock down? You save lives. But on the other hand, you hurt society. And at some stage, you might save COVID 19 lives. But in the long run, you might. Uh, there might be lives uh, spilled for other reasons. Uh, they are discussing in, I've heard in countries that if this economy breaks down totally, the, the number of suicides will increase. So the overall, the net effect might be negative if you lock down too much. But what is a good balance that uh, I prefer not to say the answer to. I understand. Um... Then uh, maybe a last question. Um, by the way, uh, there are a lot of very positive comments, like excellent talk, wonderful introduction to the topic. So uh, you can take that with you. So um, let me add one thing. Um, the, yeah. This uh, of these of these curves that are here, and you can of course imagine that there are curves in between. But the black and the red curve are definitely not among the optimal solutions. That is clear. So it is sort of in the lower range where the optimal solution is. But which of these, that I don't prefer not to say. But clearly, yeah. if you do this, the, the healthcare system will break down and you will have additional deaths, both because you are more infected, but also additional deaths because the healthcare system doesn't uh, breaks down. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so, um, since R not is such an important uh, number, the question I would have for you is how reliable are all the estimates of R not that we hear from various po public authorities, politicians? In Germany, there is a, is a particular institute, and and also because it seems that. We are interested in RE, as you said, because R0 changes over time. Yes. Um, so, for instance, in Germany, Ms. Merck has gone uh, live saying now R0 is about 0.9. Um, how reliable are these estimates based on your exp uh, experience? Because they are very much model dependent. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, so, R0, I mean, it, R0 is an average. You, one must remember that, keep that in mind, that it's sort of an average. So, um, if you consider a country as a community, then my guess is that the um, people have much more contacts with each other in the big cities as compared to the countryside. So, the average number of contacts among people that live in cities is, is lower in the countryside. So it is uh, simplification to talk about one single value of R0. So, pro I mean, R0 is bigger in cities and smaller in rural areas, and probably it differs between different countries due to cultural reasons as well. So it is yeah. a simplification to talk about one single R0, uh, mm -hmm. put it like that. Okay, thank you. I, I guess a sort of related the uh, question I had in mind was whether we can trust the estimates that these authorities are coming up with. Um, I mean, do they do, do the people that produce these numbers know how to actually calculate or not? I would, uh, well, uh, you mentioned some politicians, uh, yeah. Well, th that is this RE, rather, the over time. Yeah, someone said now RE is 0 0.8. Yeah. That is hard. But uh, in general, if p p countries have some uh, feeling of if the number of infections, is it in, are we having more and more infections per day or are we having, fewer and fewer infections per day. That is possible to, to meet by testing. Uh, 
And if the number of infections, new infections per day is decreasing, that means that RE is smaller than one. Whereas if it is increasing, it means that the effective reproduction number is bigger than one. So that I think one can rely on. But the, the exact value, if it is 0 0.9 or 0 0.8, I wouldn't trust that very much. But if you see the plot the reported case the number of reported cases over time that will still give an indication if it is growing the reproduction number is bigger than one if it is decaying the reproduction number is smaller than one but this is not r naught is it it is the current uh, what i called rt and what is some kind sorry what i called re and what is some in other places called rt as a function of time Okay, thank you for clarifying. So, uh, many thanks on behalf of all of us here at the ECB, Tom. We will share your presentation with all the colleagues that had signed up, but we didn't have space for them because this technology doesn't allow for more than 30 people to, to listen in. So, that's why we have the video for them. And uh, with that, thank you very much. And I um, hope you stay healthy there in Sweden. Um, I will uh, do my best. <laughs>